Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick, where the debates are hotter than Stacy's mom, and the knowledge is more memorable than that one time at band camp. I'm your host, Johnny Blackburn, and with me as always are my co-hosts Gary Elmore and Neil Riley. Glad you guys could be here again. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you guys were able to make it. I know it's a, a real long drive uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, our, to our houses since uh, COVID is still in effect and keeping us all separated for the time being. Uh, hopefully that ends soon so we can all be reunited because it would feel so good. Uh, <laughs> you did say I was getting reimbursed for gas, correct? Uh, yes, we definitely have the funds in the bank account to reimburse you for gas. Fantastic. Don't tell Neil that we don't have the funds. No, to, no, yeah. no, no funds There's whatsoever. There's no stipend at all. I didn't mute my mic. It oh, doesn't oh, matter. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're, uh, we're, we're more than lucky to have on with us this week a uh, local uh, cinematographer and gaffer, our good friend BJ Llewellyn. BJ, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. And uh, this week's topic, we are going to be talking about uh, cinematography and lighting and uh, how that kind of, we're going to be going around on how that affects the mood of uh, a scene and the entire movie, uh, how critical those two aspects are to uh, conveying the artistic vision uh, that the director and screenwriter originally had, uh, conveying that to the audience. Uh, so BJ, I, you know, this is your first time on uh, the podcast with us, so you want to give a little bit of background info to the good listeners out there about who you are and what you've been doing? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, yeah, like he, Johnny kind of introduced me pretty well. I'm the cinematographer that's been working in the Austin film industry for a while, and I get to travel around Texas and a few other places to go do some other crazy things. But generally, I've been working on lighting and camera stuff for the better part of 10 years. And while I probably still don't know anything compared to some of the, the greats that are out there, hopefully I've learned enough that maybe I can impart something onto somebody. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you take away anything, I'll be happy. Even literally like one snippet from something here, maybe you're like, oh, that's a good idea. It could be worth it. It's like I like to read those uh, little photography books that you find in stores yeah. sometimes. The really intro, super basic ones. Sometimes, like even the ones that are just like, oh, blah, you just need to do this because at the end, there's always a little section where they're like, here's some fun tips. And most of them I've heard before, but every now and then you hear something new and all it takes is one little bit and you kind of learn something out of it. And you're like, OK, I think I can use that somehow. <laughs> now, yeah, very nice. Now, so so I guess a little back a bit of background. One thing that I've always thought was kind of funny is uh, I, I, I worked over really, I guess, over the last Two years, I guess I'd say. Um, I've been able, I've had the privilege of working with uh, BJ and uh, his dad, who's been in uh, the film game for, I mean, gee, what, f a four long decades time. at this point? I don't know, but <laughs> Three I, IMDb has merged our profiles, so it's it's running at 40 years, <laughs> apparently, that I've been that. in the industry, that's, that's and very I'm down. impressive, BJ. <laughs> Thank yes, you. Yes, for a man of only 30 years old to 40 years in the, in, in the industry. Very impressive. <laughs> his father it's had absolutely 40 years. amazing. Oh, Collectively, they've got, they've got 40. So... I remember your dad telling me the story, uh, and you can shed some light on this for us. He actually was getting you onto film sets, and you were helping out before you were of legal age to actually do so and get paid. Yeah, what's and the statute of limitations <laughs> on something like that? Uh, 18, but yeah, no. Uh, so, <laughs> oh crap. Uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, when I I started being in movies like or in TV shows, commercials and things when I was literally like six weeks old. I was in my first actual commercial. Um, they would just oh. throw me in as a baby. And then as I was a kid, I was an extra working on different things every now and then. Of course, I had no idea what I was doing, but I've actually like <laughs> if you could find all the uh, re-recorded over a couple of times VHS tapes and really bad stuff every now and then. I, there are a few of my weird random things through the 90s. Right. But at some point when I was about 14, I started actually being old enough to go onto a movie, like to get pulled into a movie set and understand what was going on. And I started working on jobs and I wasn't really any good, but it was fun <laughs> and it paid me Gotta money. Start somewhere. Uh, start somewhere. So, yeah, I just kind of started learning a little bit there. And, you know, I'd lie about my age and kind of get paid a little bit on the side. But, hey, at least <laughs> I still got to work and kind of learn and meet a lot of people. And I didn't really realize how many people I met till uh, when I was 18 and graduated 17 and I graduated high right. school, uh, I joined the union and the union voted me in. And I was like, oh, wow, they actually like voted me in. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, all of them. 
Like they all know you personally because you've worked so with all of them over the, the last like three years. I, I, I don't know if you know this. Were you the youngest person ever voted into the union, at least in the state I, of Texas? Or I think so, but I can't really find any concrete that's, evidence that's about ins- that. But I'm not really sure anyone's ever been voted in like the day after yeah. they graduated high school. I, that's just that's insane because you how many hours do you typically have to rack up to get into um, to get into the uh, the Gaffing Union? I mean, I mean, typically you need like 30 days of union work or 90 days of non-union. Uh-huh. And I I had it. I had that many days. So when I just like gave them like, here's a bunch of my call sheets. They were like, oh, yeah, this is a, like a lot. You have a ton of jobs. And I was like, yeah. And they were like, OK, well, uh, technically like the 90 days, because like there's like a distinction between the grips and electrics in Right. Uh, you know, the cinema world and mm-hmm. all that, but in the union as well. So I only technically qualified as an electric, not as a grip, which is stranger because I actually, especially at the time, was better as a grip than as an electric. But they were like, well, technically you only qualify as this, but the way that the union in Austin mm-hmm. works, 484, that covers all of Texas and a little bit of Oklahoma, as soon as you have applied for it or are in it, you're now eligible to work regardless of other status. So me being an electric, I could technically go be a hair makeup person because <laughs> it's still in the industry. I've applied, and that's I all. I would like to see that. I would, would you, love yeah. to see no, you do, do my hair, hair makeup. makeup. You should I not, think, not you know, see that. You know, we've played around with this idea before, and I don't remember if it – if it was Gary, if it was you or Neil, if it was your idea, but we had played around with the idea of everybody on our next project switching the, from the roles they normally mm-hmm. do yeah. and trying something completely different. Yep. yep. Um, I'm, I'm sure I think chaos would, be, would ensue. Yeah, absolute Depending disaster. On, <laughs> the, dis- on what the, the jobs dis- were. The disaster artist. All right. So Gary, you're going to go gaff. Yep. Yep. Okay. And Neil, you'll do DP. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. And, right, and right. I'll, Perfect. I'll run crafty. Yep. You, Johnny, you're, you're responsible Ooh, for the food. I don't know how well that's going to I, I will say, if you're looking for the humor in it, I may be better suited in the art department. I am, like, incapable of making things, like, as props look pretty on camera. <laughs> like, people are like, hey, go cover that logo with some tape so that it looks normal. And then I cover it, and they're like, wow, can anybody else go fix whatever the hell he just did? That looks absolutely horrible. Can anyone horrible. not fuck this so, up, please? Yeah. Except this guy over here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, I guess... Uh, at the very beginning, you had, a, from what I remember you telling me, you had a ton of experience um, in a lot of larger productions and stuff. So before the 18th birthday and stuff, um, what what big shows were you working on that were that were out here in Austin being filmed? Yeah, well, at the at that time, like I said, I've been working on like large scale commercials and right. things like huge, big right. stuff uh-huh. uh, of every kind of caliber one can imagine mm-hmm. for the commercial mm-hmm. market. But then. When I got into the union, I instantly started on Friday Night Lights and Machete. My right, first, that's what I was looking for. the day after I got into the union, the next day I worked on Machete, mm-hmm. uh, and I was a rigging electric on first unit, and that was their last day of principal production. And then I did uh, another day with them after that, and got to meet a bunch of really crazy cool people. Um, and then I started on Friday Night Lights, and I was really worried when I first got on a set because I was like, man, I. I don't think I'm going to know anybody. And I, I met the grips and I didn't know a single one of the grips because like I had always worked with my dad and his guys and they don't do TV shows. Right. So I was just like, oh man, I'm not going to know anybody on the set. And then I walked on and realized even though I didn't know any of the grips, I knew every single other person of every department. I'd worked with wow. them on commercials and everything else. And I was like, oh, ah, I'm, I'm right fine. These yeah. are all cool. So I started working with that. I worked on Boyhood. Uh, that was started filming right around then. I did a few years on that i think four or five years whatever was one year short of me actually getting a credit (laughs) for it or getting uh not a credit but a uh a a jump in payment so i am credited on it but everybody got paid more if you made it to a certain year mark and i missed it (laughs) so bj what um what do you find most fascinating about what you do i mean what what are some of the more interesting concepts or theories behind you know how how film is put onto film or digital now I would say the the fun part to me is getting to do something different like so, so many of the time like especially with a lot of commercial projects you get like a very 
you know, it, you're not trying to like rewrite the world. You're not trying to make something brand new. You're like, you're trying to just like get something out there. And a lot of times it gives you the chance of saying, Hey, okay, we're going to get the basics. We're going to cover these things that we need. We need a person talking to the camera, holding a product, blah, blah, blah. But then they're like, Hey, we also kind of want to get some of this and we want to, we want to do something different. And they start giving you more choice to do what you want. And so sometimes you definitely don't get to like exercise your creativity, but sometimes you get to fully do it. I've gotten to work with a couple of projects lately where I've been like, you know, God say, Hey, this is the feeling we want to convey, but how do you want to convey it? And so I get to work with them to like decide on different tools and ideas to, to put into a project. You know, it's like one thing to get the clearest, sharpest, perfect lens to see everything you want. But sometimes you're like, Hey, you know what, what if we went really crazy and shot on some vintage lenses and made everything really pretty and dreamy and people go, Oh man, that's awesome. And it's, <laughs> fun to just try different stuff and then some people go uh no we want to see what the hell we're doing and i go okay but it's it's cool to be able to work with people and talk with them and try out new ideas and new concepts and it makes it really exciting okay. so let me ask you this because i have worked with you on a few projects how do you i guess what would you say that it's like to work uh, with directors? Because the director of photography um, has a lot of input on how the scene is shot. And how do you balance that out with the director's uh, vision for the movie as well? I mean, you, I know you've worked on a lot of different projects and some you've had more input than others. So how does that kind of shake out for you? Um. It's it's really interesting because it's like one of those things that you almost you kind of stop thinking about it as you go into it, where it's like I just kind of go into this mode of like, like I have like a getting this thing done and what it's going to take to do it. And so typically before we go into a job, I've I've discussed with the director like what what we're doing, what the look and the feel of the job is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I've assembled the tools and spoken with other crew members to make sh to get to the point that we have all the things required to do it, whether it's from makeup with looks, with lighting, with this type type or style of lights that we want to do to get it. And the camera department with all of our camera stuff, we're going to get what type of equipment, you know, every single thing like that to help build the look and the feel of something. Mm -hmm. And so when you get there on the day with the director, you already kind of know what you're getting into. And hopefully you even have like things like a storyboard or a shot list, but if nothing else, you at least have a plan. So when you walk in, you either have already scouted the location or you're seeing it for the first time. You you know the things you're already looking for. You're seeing the I look at it first from a practical perspective. I look around and I see where the power is, where the windows are in a room, where the active lights are, what type of lighting they are, how they're going to affect the scene, whether I need to have them on or off to particularly be in it and how we're going to adapt to it. And I'm as I'm processing all of those things, uh, I'm also checking with the director to see exactly what he's thinking for this for a certain piece. So if we were somewhere that we only really needed to be by a window and that needed to be the main light and I looked and the room that we're in has a lot of tungsten overhead lighting, uh, then I would turn off all the tungsten so that we're now in a single color scale or in a single source of color that we can balance our camera mm -hmm. to. But if we are not somewhere where that option happens, where per se, there's a lot of different multiple color units to the scene, we can work on isolating and like isolating the, our subject and what we need to do so that the color is the truest that it can be there. And as you're looking at all these things, you're talking with the director to figure out exactly how you can achieve that best. And they know, you know, your, your director has an idea of what he's going to do with his actors. And as a, the DP, your goal is to take what he wants the actors to do and make it beautiful and read on camera. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I guess to, to it's, let's kind of flip it around and, and segue into an, another area that I kind of wanted to touch base on. So the, you're all, you've always been behind the camera for a long time, for most of your adult life. I would, I think that's safe to say. So yeah, I, I'd say the last five to seven years I've been kind of yeah. behind the camera. I bought a camera and was like, I'm going right, to figure this right. stuff out. And so, and I did. so from an audience perspective, when you actually go see a movie, uh, and I know we had briefly gone over this the other day, but when you're watching a film, what do you typically notice yourself looking for really common? Like, you know, like, well, I, I say this is this is kind of how I look at it. So the first thing I try to do when I'm watching a movie for the first time mm -hmm. is enjoy it. I don't well, sure. <laughs> try to look 
for any of the things, mm-hmm. right? But then there's a few things that happen that take me out of it a movie and yeah. make me start looking it's at nature, it. Yeah, it, yeah it's kind of got to be now. Like I can go to a point where I'm in a full like super hypercritical mode, but like I I try not to do it because it's like a it's not enjoyable for right. me and like it just really takes it out. So I would say that one of the first things that I that I notice when is not right in a movie is like the pacing and the rhythm. Um, and the biggest one that I know when it happens, which, which I've hit in a few movies that when I tell people it, they get mad at me for saying it. So I don't want to even name which specific movies. No, 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 but, you um, have to tell us. You can't yeah, leave us hanging. Don't do this. Uh, <laughs> come oh, on, man. come on, man. No, well, it, come one on. Of the, all right, one of them, one of them that totally gets me is the new Tarantino movie that everybody really loves. Once Upon a uh, Time in Hollywood. Oh, uh, once upon, don't. Yeah, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I actually do like mm. it. I actually do yeah, like the well, movie. That's, that's good. Um, We're not fans here on this podcast. There's... <laughs> oh, that, that's OK. Uh, I wasn't a fan when I first saw it. Let's just say that. Or, you know, we'll, we'll leave that for another debate. Let's stick oh, with the first okay, question right. and then I'll jump into the hating on that one. But um, uh, yeah, it can go either way. But mm-hmm. no, uh, what happens is there's a certain point in a movie where I kind of lose track of the movie and I realize that I'm sitting in a chair watching right. it. And I don't I haven't really figured out what causes that. But to my best, like of ability that i can tell it seems to be where sometimes you just kind of lose your pace and you're kind of like okay like something's here and then that usually takes me out to noticing more things um but i'd that's the biggest one to me some some movies make it happen for me more some happen less but it's kind of just something about the rhythm and the feel of the edit that i feel does it the most and not that i'm even necessarily blaming an editor because it's the shooter that's also conveying that message but some that's the first thing that I look for when I'm watching a movie. And then the other one that tricks me out, which, again, only really comes because I'm a camera nerd, is I can I'm really bothered by missed focus marks. Mm. That one drives me crazier. Um, most other stuff, honestly, I don't really notice a lot of the like, like, I guess because I am in the industry, like I'm not bothered by like things like the uh, Sing the, boom. Uh, the Game of Thrones coffee cup that's like left in there. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, they left a coffee cup. I'm like, ah, yeah, it happens. whatever, just let it go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I go on. People are like, oh, my God, Starbucks exists so, in so the, the universe. Only thing like, from, ah. The only thing from the cinematography world that bothers you is is missed focus marks. There's not like there's nothing like missed opportune lighting. Like I was talking to uh, uh, we have a mutual friend, Chris Cogswell, who's also in the industry out here. And so he always told me that the first thing as a gaffer, as someone who, you know, con- you know, controls setting up lighting and, and all that, that was always the biggest thing for him. And that would make or break a movie he was like to my core i i don't necessarily intentionally try to do that but he was like i always just go back to looking at the lighting and how it affects the scene and whether you know a certain character is too washed out or you know the undertone doesn't really match uh, with uh, what they're wearing yeah that's like that. that is true that that definitely does happen but i'd say there's kind of two caveats to that that i try not to really look for as a pure judge especially on like the first sure. viewing which is a lot of times when they talk about somebody being washed out is like when you're like they're too hot basically like right. you know all of digital film is between 0 and 100% like that's just anything beyond that is gone there's like something called like a roll off which is like mm-hmm. how nicely that thing blows but the big thing is the cameras that that professionals shoot on are so much more competent right. than the display that you're watching on that a lot of times I kind of give it away. Like, I'm just kind of like, eh, it's probably not that bad. Like, I've seen a lot of stuff that on my TV is really black, and it's because I know my TV sucks. So I, I try not to judge it from that. And if I'm really bothered by something, I'll, I will re-pull it up on a better monitor and look at it. But for, for the most part, yeah, like, I would say so. But the other thing to remember is that lighting is, like, is an art and art is subjective True. so sometimes you can be super underlit or in a weird way and it's because you're trying to make a point right. with it even if i might not necessarily agree with it you're like man that was a really dark scene that i don't know what happened right. and you're like that and they probably intended for me to see that he kills this guy that i probably should have seen that but uh, you know, eh, so it's like one of those things that it won't make a break a movie to me, but it will definitely add to the point. Uh, yeah, Johnny and I were watching a Neil Breen movie last night oh, where uh, that's Twisted just, Bear. That's, that's classic cinema right classic, there. Classic, where he uh, was working yeah. on lighting and uh, every shot pretty much had a, uh, like, from like the top left to the bottom right, a streak of light, and that was like the main light in the shot. And mm-hmm. it gets... Uh, 
got a little repetitive, I think. Yeah, just a tad. Yeah. I mean, oh, it's basically yeah. like they, I don't know what type of light they had, but basically it seemed like they had barn doors, like, encompassing, like, around it, and then they closed yeah, them there was a... to just make this tiny slit, and I think he was trying to be dramatic and artsy with yeah. it, but it just didn't make any sense. It was every mm. scene. It was yeah. <laughs> It's it called horrible. The Slash. <laughs> it was horrible. And it was... <laughs> so when when was that movie-ish made? 2018. 2018, yeah. This guy is also... Ooh, like, this this guy is like... You've heard of the movie The The Room, right? You've heard of the... Okay, yeah, yeah, So yeah. Tommy Wiseau, the guy that created that, a, a lot of critics called him like... You know, they're like, oh, he's the... He's the uh, Alfred Hitchcock of shitty films, you know? Uh, so this, <laughs> this, this Neil <laughs> Breen guy came along about two years, I think, because 2006 was his first one, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was 2010, wasn't it? No, 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 no. That, okay. that was his second movie. Um, but anyway, so he came around a couple years after The Room came out, and so now people are saying, they're like, oh, wow, this guy has, you know, they've, he's superseded Tommy Wiseau as, as the king of crap. Or subseded. I don't know yeah. how that would work. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true, yeah. I guess, yeah, if it's if he's one of the worst of all time. So, um, so BJ had a... Hey, it's a race to the <laughs> bottom, so. man. It's a, it's a long fall. <laughs> so, <laughs> long BJ, and hard. I, I had a question for you. So when, um, like, a director gets with you and says, um, and y'all are figuring out how to set up a shot, do you prefer it if uh, the director gives you a more technical aspect? So, like, you know, I want the light over here. I want it to be, you know, this bright. Um, and then I want it to be, you know, the focal points to be here and here. Or do you prefer when he kind of tell, you know, they, the director kind of tells you more like, this is the mood I want. This is the kind of uh, feeling I want to evoke. This is what I want it to look like overall. I would say honestly both, but I would I would lean towards I like a technical director who is more technical saying I want this thing here. But I like them to be willing to change and compromise mm -hmm. um, because it's there's definitely no problem with somebody saying, hey, I need this thing to be here and do this. And it's like, OK, cool. But like sometimes you might say, hey, this is I know what you're trying to achieve with this look and what you're doing isn't actually the, either the most efficient way or going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I worked with I worked on a. Uh, big budget uh commercial a while back and i don't know if i'm even legally allowed to say what it is so sorry but it's a it was it's nike a, it was nike it's, yeah it's a hang on let's go with it's a caffeinated soda water let's go with that um and i won't say anything <laughs> Which else that could be <laughs> uh, that, that's general enough that you can't sure, really tell there's, so there, there's a lot of different like ones Dr. in there Pepper. boom yeah uh, boom so either way uh the dp from it mm -hmm. uh was convinced that he needed to get a super flare in this shot, which is fine. I like flares and shots all the time. Here's the problem. The, the whole point of a flare, right? There's a few things that you need to happen to have a flare in the lens. There's not a lot of them, but a couple of things. So A, you need a source of light that hits the lens to create the flare, which is, you know, uh, w which is what creates it in the first place. So you have to physically put it somewhere. Here's the thing. We're on the roof of a building on 6th Street, three stories up, and the behind our character, which is where the light would need to be, is the middle of 6th Street. And we don't have access to get onto any other buildings or anything that we have with us that can get above three stories high to get a light on the frame. Mm -hmm. So we ended up ha hand-holding a light extremely close to the lens to cheat it kind of from a different perspective which in and of itself isn't bad and you can work around that like i do that sometimes too here's the thing the light was a particularly massively huge light and still didn't really work and it's because of the problem too the director had chosen the wrong lens for the shot or the dp oh, and the director goody. had chosen the wrong lens for the shot they had gotten uh specifically airy uh master primes mm -hmm which are some of the best lenses made. They're really great. And their entire design is to reduce flares. Mm. They're specifically <laughs> made for like something like when you want to shoot the next Transformers movie and you need a guy on a green screen and you need the absolute utmost resolution and critical focus. Like your, your whole goal is to just get information to give to the CGI people to make more stuff. They're a great lens. They're perfect for what they do. They don't flare. They are like they're eighty thousand dollars spent on that one lens to make it not oh flare. Dear. So with all the work that we Jeez. did, that lens did not flare. Okay, just fix it in like, post. Period. It's fine. No, don't say don't yeah. say you that. Just add that. For, me, don't be for, for everybody that's out there that's not familiar with being on a film set, people will joke around and say, "We'll fix it yeah. in post." It's a 
bad idea. That's yeah. horrible advice. Right. Never do That's that. That's why on all of Johnny's movies, we have to fix it and post everything all the time. <laughs> I've never said that one time. <laughs> I mean, that's also Gary's favorite yeah. saying. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's true. It's also Gary's favorite saying. It also doesn't help that I think between yeah. you, me, and Neil, we've yeah. been in pretty much every project that we've all yes. done over the last yeah. five years. Um, so, yeah. Um, but uh, so. Well, I, 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 I worked on a job for a cell phone uh, broadcasting company. I don't know. Take, take with that what you will. And we always uh, did a ton of different jobs for different phones that they came out with. And if we all, they always would try to fix these reflections. And at some point, there was a few people they'd work with. They'd just go, ah, we'll just fix it in post. It's fine. We'll fix it in post. God, it's fine. No. After about three months, one day, there was a new guy no. on the set. And we went and he goes, I'm here. <laughs> I'm the guy that has to fix it in yes. post. I'm going to tell you what you can or can't fix in post. You're not fixing that. Like, we can put this light here and make that not happen. Right. He goes, good, yeah. do it. Take five minutes. That's you can't afford to fix this. Applause for that gentleman right yeah. there. That's a good. That's a good man right there. Because that is a lot of work. He that is post. a lot. That, that is a lot of work. So, uh, so let's. I want to change gears a little bit back to what we were originally talking about. So, so you're saying as as a primarily as a professional cinematographer and gaffer, normally when watching a film, you don't typically notice the things that are relevant to your professional work as the first initial thing in a movie. It's typically it's it's pacing or it's the story itself. Typically. Yeah, I would say that's the first okay. most thing. I mean, like I, I can I can definitely if there's some crazy shit going on, like something out of Inception yeah, or whatever, yeah. that's going to definitely make me like look at it first okay. and go like that. But for the most part, I try to look at it in a sense of wonder and I'm not really taken aback by something sure. until I notice right. it's wrong. It's like, you know, if 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 no one really notices it's wrong, is it really wrong or is it just a different choice? Right. So uh, so I, so I, I, I want to pose that question to so to Neil. Neil, Neil, you're primarily a screenwriter, director, and producer. So, what is the first thing that you notice when you're watching a film? What typically are you looking for? What pops out? Uh, for me, I mean, the, to me, the film is usually built around the sound. So, if the sound is not matching up or it's not, it's not where you know I may have taken it. That's usually the first thing that stands okay. out to me. So, are, is it is it is it just composition and the score or is it also Foley like and overlaying sounds and stuff like that? Or is it, is it everything all together? Or... I mean, it's everything. I mean, you, you and I have sat through movies where, you know, you're like, Oh my God, everything is too quiet or that That's audio true. is way too loud. You know, it's a balance. Of yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. So, and so, so Gary, I posed that same question to you. Now, obviously you, you do screenwriting and directing and stuff, but primarily what you've been doing over the last year is your are your, your lead feathers posting, like right, you're, you're yeah. editing guy. So for you, you're the guy that fixes yeah, it. You're, the guy, oh, you're the guy that we screw yeah. on set. You exactly, know? And in fact, yes. on our last shoot, multiple times during the shoot, <laughs> yeah. uh, BJ, BJ was, was like, apologizing to Gary. Post. He was just like, I heard that, BJ. Sorry. <laughs> he was like, sorry about that, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I like to give subtle notes to the editor when we're <laughs> yes. shooting, and I'm like, by the way, that that one was horrible. Use the <laughs> yeah. next one. Don't do it. Don't it's do it. It's wonderful just having your voice whispering in my ear on the headsets. Sweet I really nothings. appreciate it. I try to do it really softly, too. It was better as a footage. It's like a weird cinematic ASMR. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's going to be okay. You, you can, can do, do it. it. It'll be fine. So so for Gary, what, what's the first thing that typically is, is it, is it the pacing and editing for you or is it something else? For me, the, like what I notice first about a movie uh, probably is going to be the, the pacing of it. I would agree to okay. that because. So, so this it is relevant to what you're professionally doing. Yeah. Oh, I mean, okay. cause like the pacing of a movie, I think, um, can really like determine how you feel about it more right. than, more than anything else. I mean, m music is of course very, very important sound. Um, and then the visual is also very important, but it's what both the, those mediums combine to make that really, you know, the sum is more than the whole of the parts. Right. Or something like that. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. There we go. It's close. I, I, we go. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ah, close close enough. Enough. Under, I'll fix what you mistake in post. <laughs> yes. Please, please yes. don't do that. Uh, we'll just There's go, some parts in there we'll somewhere. Go with the live version. Um, and, you know, and that's, and for me, you know, primarily it's it's that same thing you know mm. primarily i'll you know i'll 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 direct ad or or produce screen right here and there but yeah my biggest thing is is the script mm -hmm. for me it's always the dialogue um you know i i can't tell you how many times i've seen even short films that mm -hmm. people um people post on those like the film facebook groups which actually have a lot of pretty the majority of the posts you know i'd say at least 65% of them are all professional paying posts. So, uh, you know that most of the time the stuff you're watching is, is going to be okay. It's going to be decent, but I was yeah. watching this thing today and it hasn't 
technically premiered yet. I don't want to call people's names out, but the script was was actually really solid and it was really good. Um, but the guy who played the dad just was he was just fucking awful. OK, and I, I don't right. mean, I, I don't mean to be. All right, looking for just, dad movies that are premiering on Facebook, <laughs> yeah. guys. We gotta, t- we gotta look for them. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you when. Uh, I'll tell you when we're when it's over. But uh, you know, so sometimes, yeah, I think for all of us, I guess my point in that being, yeah, sometimes it's the acting, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so I think for all of us, even though we professionally we have one key area we like to hone in on, mm-hmm. and that's the area we're naturally going to think about. You know, there are other. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we get tired of working on those so often that we force ourselves to focus on something else when we're watching yeah. a movie. Well, you know, I, in our craft I, th- I think we- it's also like if everything's at a certain level, like it's got to be a certain competency level, right. uh, like the script has to be competent. The acting has to be competent, lighting and sound. And then if something doesn't reach that level, that's when you notice it as like, a, Ooh, this is really bad. I saw the boom or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then absolutely. And then, from there, you can notice sort of the, the upward spikes of like the brilliant things that are done, like um, uh, in se- like in um, Christopher Nolan's movies, like visually, they are very, very uh, enticing. And I think that, yeah. you know, those are usually an outstanding piece of Christopher Nolan's movies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the cinematography, for sure. I mean, you know, if you look at if you look at him, um, you know, and Alejandro Inarritu, um even Tarantino's films, I don't, I don't, BJ, I don't know if you know if he uses the same uh, director of photography for all of the films or if he switches it up or if anybody knows. Um, um, he used them for a lot, but uh, I think the, the main goal, which actually is really interesting, you bring him up for that because the big thing for him is he had the same editor for almost all of his movies until she died Did very she early. Like, yeah. How long ago, Neil? How yeah, before, think? what is it? A couple of years ago, I believe. Okay. Yeah, it was just before. Um, Once upon a time in Hollywood or uh, magnificent. No, um, no, the one before. Hateful Eight. Eight. Ma- yeah, magnificent. Uh, Hateful Eight. Hateful Eight. Um, so, which, which is very funny because so Tarantino was known for overshooting a lot of things, right? And it takes <laughs> it takes somebody who you trust and know to be able to say, "Hey, I know you shot all this stuff, but this stuff's crap. I'm throwing it out. Right. We're going to use this, right?" And so when he brings on a new editor, who still I think did a great job with the other two movies, I. I get the feeling that from the fact that both of the two movies he's released since then have been extra long, that editor has been a little more afraid to push and say, Hey, um, I don't think we should be making a movie that needs a, uh, a, a intermission, like a no. 15 minute intermission at a bathroom break for people. <laughs> and cause he's they don't want to say it. They're like, Oh, I don't know, man. He's, there's a reason he's who he mm. is. And so, uh, you know, both uh, both Hateful Eight and um, Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, mm-hmm. both are a lot longer. And yes, it's, they are. Could be. Yes, are. Don't know why, but could mm-hmm. be that it's because there's a new editor. Okay, hey, yeah, that that would make that would make a ton of sense. Um, so, do you have a question? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. So I kind of wanted to. We we were kind of talking about the industry a little bit, and you know, a lot of a lot of technical professional things about jobs in in particular um but i kind of wanted to change gears a little bit and go to changing gears oh yeah boop, boop. here we go from first to- yeah so <laughs> i know i'll fix it in post that's the, that's the best awful one i've heard in a long <laughs> thank time you, thank you uh so to kind of give people uh you know especially i mean for the, our listeners that are there's probably we have we've got listeners that are avid moviegoers and just absolutely love film mm-hmm. and we've also got people that are in the industry but we also have people who enjoy going to the movies and maybe they just want to learn a little bit more about film so let's play a little bit of uh, a little bit of a game um did you ever see the movie it, saw it's gonna be like that <laughs> yeah yeah are you ready oh, oh, oh no oh no <laughs> Uh, how would how oh would God. how would you how would, coming coming from a lighting and and uh, cinematography standpoint? How would you go about setting the scene for um, let's say like the opening of a love story, uh, or how, how would you, how would you kind of like we'll go through a couple genres and t- you tell us how would you like let's say you had full control. Well, it's go. it's it's kind of interesting because I'll I'll totally run through these, but you honestly you know you really need to tailor it to try and convince the point of a story. You know, you can kind of give a few of the kind of generalized things, like, for example, with a love scene or like not necessarily love scene, but hey, but um, with like a, a romance type intro, maybe you want to give it that little bit of like extra prettiness. So okay. depends. Do you want to do you want it to feel more like an art house 
French love movie? Mm-hmm. Do you want to get like obscure street shots of like of us of uh, an empty European street that then give way to like a unique framing of a person like putting a closed sign on a store mm-hmm. as they're walking away from it and they're like interrupted by somebody? Mm-hmm. Or do you want to like have it be just like a close up of eyes as like we you you're discussing something and do you like typically I would personally want to be on a softer lens right. for that right. for that kind of a uh, thing so I might choose a set of lenses that uh, like something like the super speeds that a lot of people love the Zeiss super speeds that particularly when you get towards the more open end get super dreamy okay. uh, take something like that when you're filming somebody to give that a different feel versus the lenses I talked about that you would use for a freaking Marvel movie <laughs> where you can see every pore on the girl's face and the makeup artist is hitting you because like, why the fuck did you choose the mm-hmm. lenses that are like literally destroying every bit of work that she's right. done. So, um, you know, it's like little things like that. So for example, like then that you would also want to do a little more beauty lighting. What's um, that? can you give you us might a little wanna, detail on So, so the base part of beauty lighting is a li- is hair light and a lot more of a flat light look for the most mm-hmm. part. Um, so typically, I would say with a guy, you would want to give them a lot of contrast, right? People really love when, and also it sells a lot to, to have a guy that has like a super dark side of his face and all of his shadows are chiseled and reads out super cool. And boat. with the girl, you may want her to read softer. So you don't want to accent any of the particular. You may not want to accent. Uh, accentuate any of the features of her face other than like the big stuff so you may want to have a uh like a softer light in the front the little bit of fill on the edges uh to kind of bring in a little bit of light and just kind of soften the whole soften the whole piece out and of course you'd want a larger source so that uh instead of having a single direct point of light like a flashlight shining in somebody's face you want to have a larger thing which was something we'd call it like a sale like a 12 by or a 20 by uh, diffusion that's a 20 foot by 20 foot diffusion that would be the equivalent of lighting somebody from all the sides in front of them at the same time Mm -hmm. it fills in all the shadows makes it look dreamy and that's what i would see as an intro to something like that you have you know you have a really soft pretty scene that you can kind of set you get a little bit of drama and contrast in the background with darkness maybe a pop of color somewhere to help something and you can work with that color then and have that be like an accent for the Mm -hmm. movie and you can basically kind of use use color and the rest of that to try and move the story forward okay okay uh how how about for uh what's something else that's an iconic genre how about horror film so yeah horror film i mean it would you would look at something and say hey for example like you know it depends on your intro do you want it to be harder do you want it to be soft do you want it to read you know how hard do you want to hit the audience when it starts do you want to hit them so that they know the the dark scary part with the first Mm -hmm. scene or you do want do you want them to not really feel like that yet do you want to build the tension um i feel like one of the cool things done with horror is that a lot of times people ramp up the cuts to be faster Mm -hmm. throughout the pacing of a scene so your first few cuts of the scene might be longer cuts, almost to the edge of like a one or something. But they might be 20 second, 25 second long cuts of people talking. And then as you get to the climax of the scene, it's getting so short. Every, you know, boom, boom, boom. Every time the camera angle is changing, the, the focus is changing, different things are moving. There's like this kinetic energy that's happening before you then drop it off and let it build to either a reveal or right. a, a lack of the reveal to happen. Mm. And so you would work on that from the pacing, but from a lighting perspective, uh, you might want to keep it, you know, maybe you use larger, brighter sources. And then as the, as the action starts to happen, you have your people move closer to those sources so that it starts to get even more accentuated. Cause one of the things that I found works really well a lot in just everything is contrast. And it's about like you, you really need to, to create something soft to make something hard feel harder to like, you need to make something dark so that you can make something really bright feel like it's blindingly bright. If you just come in with something really bright, it doesn't quite feel uh, as bright as it really is until uh. you've really seen something dark to accentuate it. Yeah, it's like yin and yang, you know? If you um, only have brightness, you can't really, like, tell how bright it is. And if you only have darkness, it it doesn't pop or it doesn't uh, also give you that it sense to- of dread. totally right? is. Okay. 
I don't know if that's an I don't know if that's detail enough on an exact horror movie, but basically you could say something for the intro is you you could stick with really hard shadows so that the you know let's say you were in the trees at night somewhere you would uh, have a, a moonlit scene so you'd take a large source and have it uh, be coming in from a back mm-hmm. edge and you'd try to maybe even blue it up a little bit to help separate and make it feel like moonlight and you then try to light the rest of your people with tungsten and adjust for that color. So the tungsten feel would make everyone feel kind of neutrally, slightly warm, and then the blue edge of the moonlight would help kind of separate them from the background and kind of light the trees in weird ways. And uh, then you could have them kind of play with light. You know, maybe you have a campfire. Maybe you've got people with flashlights. Mm. Use those sources, A, as practicals that you see people you're working with, but B, use those mentally to light from. So when you're looking at a close-up person, think of it. Like, would they be lit by the residual light of a flashlight? Maybe it's not directly on them. It's on the ground. But is that giving a source of light that kind of buys that sense of realism for the viewer right. and how to kind of direct the light from okay, it? Okay, so... So I, I don't and I don't know if you've you've done this last one that that we have up here. But uh, so how about an action scene like a like a car chase? And let's say it's out the out in the daylight and stuff. You know, car chases are they're just the most probably one of the most iconic portions of a, an action movie outside of the yeah. final confrontation with the antagonist mm-hmm. or the, wherever the villain is. Yeah. What would you, what would you say? How would you well, do that? I, I, what would you say? How would you well, the, there's two levels to look at it as I would say 80 percent of movies that you see you shoot it in the daylight, right? Like if it's a daylight scene, particularly, you shoot it in the daylight with available lighting. And for the close-ups, you cheat those and adjust and fix that lighting later, right? right? So um, let's say there's a guy driving through town. For the most part in town and he's driving around, they're not doing anything. Maybe there's a couple of lights on tops of buildings or something out of the way but for the most part you it's hard to get something that far away to compete with the sun to deal with Mm -hmm. that um you can now on the big budget movies which i'll go into in a second but for the most part you're going to do something like that and then for the close-ups where you see the person driving a lot of times they do something called the poor man's process Uh which is where either um on a on a higher budget scale is you put the car on a trailer and then uh, you'd have the trailer drive around with with an actual driver dealing with that. And that way, the person in the scene isn't focusing on that. You put overhead lighting and rigs over the car to isolate the car from the outside world. And you light accordingly to the kind of world around mm-hmm. you. You light with the levels to make things read a certain way. And as you get even farther down the line, you eventually get to the points where, and I've been on even the larger budget things that do this, you put the biggest dude on your set with a two by four wedged under the back tire, and he goes up and down on the board while the car kind of moves, and the guy like acts like he's driving. And you just kind of put everything out of focus in the background, or you try not to see it, and you deal with it all later, maybe even on a green screen. But you just try and focus on the little things. Maybe you shoot low, only looking up at a sky that's blown out, so you can't tell that he's not moving. Maybe you're looking at him adjusting do- knobs on a radio, hands on a steering mm-hmm. wheel, something you can't tell, but still give you the feel of movement of somebody driving a car. And then there's the bigger way of doing it, where, um, for example, on the uh, I got to work on a little bit of the uh, Coen Brothers remake of True Grit. Oh. And uh, when they were out in New Mexico shooting, uh giant wides of the world which you would think wow there's no way they can light that you're wrong uh they (laughs) take like about i would say they'd have eight banks like eight 18k lights or 24k lights which are the ones that are like the size of your honda fit and then put it uh put those on stands and they build a platform out of that have a couple generators for each of those lights (laughs) Um, and they would call that like platform a, right. That's like eight lights. Well, they would dot a mountain with them. They would have them like, they'd have, I don't know, probably 16, 20 different setups of those that would light and direct the scene so that they could backlight the grass as it blew in the wind, you know, like, I mean, just on the large scales where it's like they have so much money to be able to spend on stuff, they can do it. So as the horse is walking through the world of it, you get to see all of this light just beating down on it. And that's so much light you can compete with the sun. So with that same thing in there, you can do that with night scenes or with other scenes as well. You know, uh, if you're if you're Transformers and you're shooting a run through downtown L.A., you are going to dot all those buildings with giant lights so that they always have a cool back edge separating them every way that they go through. 
and you might have them on giant dimmers, they're known as Variax. Um, and those dim a light down because uh, if you tried to plug a normal dimmer into a 20K light, it would just explode in front of you. So these are basically just extremely overbuilt because they have to be uh, dimmers that uh, allow you to dim lights down uh, that have so much power that they use more than like about five to ten circuits in your house would use at a single time. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. you can do any and all of the above. But uh, I would say most movies actually generally just shoot your wides, your car stunts, your jumps like that. Uh, with available lighting from the outside right. because a lot of times there's a lot more danger involved too with having lights as well sure. sometimes you would rig lights to the hood of a car to kind of give just a little bit of something but doing that you have to know that your driver now is a lot less capable of seeing mm -hmm. and they're they are driving sometimes so right. if they're driving they are also acting and they need to focus on your scene so there's there's kind of a few different ways to do it and you kind of have to just approach every job and look at the scope and scale of it and realize where you can go if we don't have much money uh we're getting somebody on a two by four and we're pushing that car but do we have a lot of money do we have time can we sit there can we put a real hood mount on it can we get a camera mounted is can we brace it enough that we can put a light in there to give them a little light in their mm -hmm. eyes do we have some of the smaller awesome new leds that have come out that allow you to mount them in the roof of the car uh so that the camera doesn't see it uh you know can you have them pass by a few lights that you've strung up to be really beautiful flares and uh you know little pieces of bokeh in the background to make it look real um, there's just yeah. so many things you can kind of run with it it's kind of yeah, fun and uh, picking up on scope and scale i kind of wanted to transition into our last portion that we're going to talk about today and that's um sort of the aspect ratio that you film in so okay. um, to me, this is a very interesting uh, topic because there's so much, I think, thought that has to go into it um, before you start the movie. And you can't you can change, you know, and have a different aspect ratio throughout the movie. But that'll be a very jarring effect if you do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a few movies that do it, that do it really well. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of times you just have to kind of pick the scope and scale. So an example would be Wes Anderson's, uh, Grand Budapest Hotel and how they, when they're going between like the, you know, the old time stories versus the new time of like now as they're in the realiza realized world of what the hotel has become, mm -hmm. uh, the real world they're shooting on 16 by nine. It's your regular, you know, industry uh, standard, TV yeah. viewing industry standard platform that everything looks pretty normal. But when they go to old school, you go to four by three, which is the old standard. And I actually really like how they did the transition and the feel and kind of make all of that read. And I think it's really interesting, but yeah, there's definitely uh, you know, you kind of have to look at it from like an art house kind of point of view sometimes, mm -hmm. or uh, sometimes it might be cool to have multiple different cuts of like almost a, uh, the Brady Bunch style, uh, different pieces that are all in there at the same time. And so that may impact what, how you are making it happen. Oh, or yeah, you may have 16 by nine. Then there's, it comes into anamorphics and the really fun stuff, but anamorphics are really expensive, which anamorphics, if you guys don't know, I don't know how, if I should explain that or not, but, uh, anamorphics are basically, uh, kind of an old school way that people used to get the equivalent of widescreen. Mm -hmm. Uh, it started out as the only option where you could do it, where four by three, the one we were talking about, the, was the old school way, is really square. And people were like, how can we get it to be wider um, by still using the same medium of film to do this? And they said, well, if we put a lens that squeezes everything like to be tighter so that when we film it, it's actually like squeezed in and looks really weird. Then when we project it, if we project it through the opposite of that squeezing lens, we can make it twice as wide as it would be when we view it in the right. theater. So, and so, so I, I guess my, my uh, question, BJ, was um, I, I guess more in terms of like the feel of of the different aspect ratios. So, you know, you talk about sort of the the old school, like uh, like the one point three seven five by one, which is sort of like Grand Budapest Hotel, which is a very square mm -hmm. aspect ratio. Um, and then you kind of move into later of the like, uh, well, I guess earlier uh, would be like a 1.85 by one um and then like then you which is a little bit wider and then you get into more of a wide a yeah. wide screen by like uh you know the 2.2s to, to one and the 2.39s to one I, I would say uh first off i apologize in advance i'm probably wrong with all of my actual namings of the numberings because uh, i've just never bothered to learn them by the that <laughs> like 
point <laughs> format. Right? Transparency. I've learned them from a point. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just being honest. Uh, I view them in a format that a lot of the lenses are sold in. Uh, just because it makes life a little easier for me. Like I totally like I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just yeah. I, I know them as lenses are kind of sold as a one X lens would be something called spherical, mm -hmm. which is what is not having any kind of that stretch mm -hmm. is the standard 16 by nine look. Um, then you have 1.3 X anamorphic lenses, which is the like little bit of one that you talked about before you got to the full stretch. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have a 1.5 that's that middle time. And then you have a 2X, which is the, I think, the the super Star Wars-y one. I, I don't know, again, what that point is, but that's the that's the far one. When you go 2X, you're super anamorphic. Yeah. So, but I, what I would say that's really cool about anamorphics is it, it has a really interesting effect on the scene because you can get both a wide and a tight at the same mm -hmm. time. And I know that sounds really dumb when I say it, but... Uh, basically what it does is since it stretches everything two times, mm -hmm. right, it only stretches them horizontally and not vertically. So if you're shooting on a 35 millimeter lens, then your 35 millimeter is stretched out, right? Then, uh, horizontally to give you more or wait, shit, shit I'm wrong with that. It's the opposite direction, but it, it <laughs> does that same exact one, but basically it gives you, I'm totally confused. <laughs> Whatever it is, it gives you the look of a portrait lens with the width of a mm -hmm. wide. And so what it does is it allows you to take a close up and have people pull back from it. And you still kind of have like a lens that can sell both scenes at the same time. Also, it's so wide, you can kind of have two different scenes take place in the same lens. And so that gave way to a lot of inventions like the split diopter that allow you to have two different objects in focus at the same time. Because normally when you have something in focus, you only have a single point in your frame in focus. And it's a, that's a plane in front of you. With a split diopter, you can have two. You could have like, for example, there's like movies where, you know, somebody's like at a desk writing and you're seeing the teacher at the, at the board and both of them are in focus at the same time. Now Either A, you have to super stop down to get that, which even then you'll never be critical focus just because of the way that physics and optics mm -hmm. work. But if you have a split diopter, you don't have to do that. You don't have to sacrifice depth of field. You can actually get two different planes in focus at the same time. And while on a 16 by 9 lens or on a 16 by 9 frame, that may be more difficult to do because you have to then compress that to each in almost uh, two different portrait modes. On an anamorphic, you have two different full frames that allow you to see it and tell the story of a movie. So they're really cool. But honestly, my favorite thing is just the anamorphic flares, which you, you know what they are. If you've ever seen star Trek, cause it's that thing that's in the way the whole time. And you're like, Oh my God, like what is all of this flare? Um, I can't see what's actually happening. That's what an anamorphic flare is. And uh, they used a lot of them, but for the most part, I actually really do like them. Okay. They're a, they're a cool horizontal streak that can kind of pierce the image and give it a really interesting look. And they take any amount of um, lighting or background objects of a scene that normally cause like what we would call like a spherical aberration, which is like a just, you know, a circular ball or something. Mm -hmm. And they make them be shaped differently. They make them ovular. And that kind of also helps separate and add some coolness to a scene. Yeah. So when you when you combine the fact that you're on and not to mention that a lot of the ones that people shoot on are old because they're really expensive to shoot on. So people shoot on a lot of older ones. So you've got the softening agents. We talked earlier from a romance scene. Typically, you've got your um, you've got your compression of a portrait and a wide shot at the same time that we talked about. So all of a sudden now your romance scene we talked about, I'm able to get that close up shot of somebody's eyes and their movement as then they walk away and are in a wider scene with another actor. You can get that all in the same lens and it, it just all comes together and makes something that's really, really cool. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think, I think we can all agree that definitely one of that you obviously know more terminology and technical aspects about all that than we do, but I think we can all agree. No, sorry if I get no, lost. No, no, no. That, that's, that's, uh, that's why we love having you on is because you are so knowledgeable about those areas and you can give us that, that terminology that most people aren't, terribly familiar with so i think we can we can definitely all agree that mm -hmm. you know cinematography and lighting are two of the most critical and crucial aspects for any film to be successful um you know outside of his script and you've got your score and all that but i guess to, to kind of wind us down for somebody that's looking to get into the industry inside either the gaffing or the cinematography world, um, obvi the obvious answers, I think, are to, you know, PA and, like, mm -hmm. pay your dues and stuff. But what 
prior knowledge would you recommend to people that want to enter those two fields? What prior knowledge would you have them study up on before uh, entering that area? Um, what kind of things would you recommend for them to maybe watch or read or do on their own or, or anything like that? What kind of, what oh, advice? There's there's a few things. First, I, I do want to reiterate like, like kind of what you said about the, the PA sure. thing, though. The, the most important thing that you can learn in this field isn't going to be taught by any amount of YouTube videos and right. other things. It's only going to be taught by Straight experience. First hand and so the main right. thing is, if, is if you take some jobs, I don't know. I don't care about paying dues of whatever <laughs> you need to take some jobs so that you meet some people. And as you meet these people, you need to use them to meet more people to work your way into industry working professionals that will help teach you the the particular art that is one of the best ways to do it and the way that i learned it because i learned it when you know youtube was very still early right. and it may have been out but i wasn't really even on it as i was learning this stuff i was being taught thankfully by a bunch of like top name cinematographers in the world that i just happened to work with with no idea what i was doing and i was just the lighting guy that was doing stuff but i was like man that's really cool how do you do that and you're like oh that's what the rotating rig room is for that they use for uh uh, inception you're like oh i didn't even know that thing existed <laughs> and now you're you're learning why they use it and how they use it and you're like okay and so when you start learning the tools and you start working on jobs you start to understand how they work and how you can achieve things so that has helped me as a not that i write much that's helped me as a bit of a writer whenever i'm kind of writing something like i go okay well what could i use here to make this be cool oh that would be fun to make that happen so that's the first step but there are still some youtube videos that i do really like to get into and follow like i um i really like there's a, a thing that unfortunately doesn't go on anymore but there's still a library of videos called every frame of painting mm -hmm. made by uh tony and taylor i forget their last names uh but they are awesome and probably inspired me more to actually get in and do stuff more than most other things because they so eloquently actually break down stuff a lot of people on youtube i feel like are i don't know if the word is like an, an armchair critic maybe sure. but it's the, I, f I feel like they don't really know much of what they're talking about but uh this guy when you listen to him talk you're just like dang that is actually really interesting points and he does a great job of showing exactly what he's talking about as he's doing it and kind of highlighting it along the way so that's definitely one that is really unique and cool but the other thing that honestly that taught me the most from my world was i just bought a camera like uh, for mm -hmm. for a long time for five or six years of me working professionally i didn't own a camera and i didn't even have a want to own a camera i was just like cool i'm lighting i'm the lighting guy i don't need to know how the camera works i just know how to make lights work so right. i was lighting by going hey well i know typically these big guys that i work with do things like this and that looks pretty good so i would walk into a scene and say hey i know that if i do this here and this here i'm going to be in the right world and then i can adjust to the levels to make a camera person happy i know typically we're going to bang in a light through a window we're going to bring in a couple little lights in to kind of fill something in when it's happening but for the most part this is these are the objects we're going to use this is the typically the play that's going to be right and honestly that took me really far uh but buying a camera and actually just like learning how it works learning why it works and then learning the history of that as well has taught me a lot you know and it it gets you farther and farther down the wormhole of the first thing you're like oh man if i get a lens with a smaller f-stop number i get more depth of field sweet yeah. <laughs> and i can spend a lot more money getting it and you're like cool and now i don't need as many lights yeah. cool but then you're like oh now nothing's in focus because it's too small and you're like oh so okay hang on now i gotta work to the next mm -hmm. step so what what defines visual quality and visual fidelity and so that sends you down rabbit holes of instead of just sharpness and things like that you're looking at color you're looking at the way that the rendering of a bokeh comes out in the background and the way that you might i i when i look at it uh, in a scene a lot of the times i'm looking for how this thing will look out of focus I'm like, I know I'm looking at a person on a 50 millimeter lens and I know they're going to be at this distance. So if that's there, will that be a pretty out of focus shape or will it look like a big old blob of doo doo? And how will I make that look mm. better? Like, hey, put this poster on the wall and draw some writing on it. Like, what should it say? And I'm like, right. I don't care. Just write, write anything you want. I won't be able to tell. Just stick it on the wall. And oh, look, now it looks <laughs> now better. We're good. Yeah. So, so it is. So it is basically so, yeah. about, you know, it is basically 
paying it is paying your dues a little bit i mean even if it's by yourself you know it is. get the equipment oh, no. work on it yourself get some friends together do your own project and trial by error yeah you know get some real experience with that exactly. definitely so uh, yeah um so bj we want to thank you for having you on unfortunately we are all out of time for today and really quick before we go uh, a little fun thing we like to do with all of our guests and we'll do it with the um we'll do it with the the host panel today too uh we like to have you all recommend a movie for us that our viewers might want to go ahead and check out, um, preferably one that you really admire the the cinematography and the mm. lighting, since that was our topic this week. Um, but if you have a another one that you just watched recently that you're super into, we're all for that too as well. Um, does anything pop in your mind? Something you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Oh man, can one of y'all go first? Sure. Uh, I, I can I can go that's for okay. it, but no, uh, that's, that's I, I'm kind of I gotta decide. I'm I, I have one that's on the top of my head, and I'm just not sure if that's the one I want to say or if I want to pick okay. something I'll, else. I'll go first. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and stay recent um, mm-hmm. as far as cinematography goes. I think this is kind of an obvious one, um, but for those of you that haven't seen 1917 yet, mm. um, I I feel that they've been doing that the one shot nonstop camera movement. They did it. Um, I'm not gonna go into everything, but you know they perfected mm-hmm. it. I think outside of when they you know really when it really became mainstream in Goodfellas and then uh, then the West Wing picked it up uh, mm-hmm. started doing it on TV and then it really kind of started to take off over the last really over the last I'd say decade mm-hmm. in seven years in particular but 1917 for me um, what one of the most beautifully shot and overall probably the best World War One film I've ever seen mm-hmm. um, and there, there are a couple great ones but that would be my recommendation for this week 1917 okay very good Neil uh, as far as cinematography goes, I've always been a big fan of Wes Anderson and his cinematography. Oh, yeah. He always has very good color palettes. Each movie has a different feel just based on the color palette. So my recommendation is going to be my favorite from him, which would be Life Aquatic mm. Seeds of Soup okay. with Bill. Yes. You know, I actually just watched that for the first time like two weeks ago. I've, it's been on my list, and I've been like, I need to watch this movie. Everybody says it's good, and I love Wes Anderson, and I just haven't watched it, and I finally did. And man, that was that was a really cool movie. I like the first half of the movie. I was like, I don't know. I mean, it's fun, but it kind of feels like a really indie version of Wes Anderson. I don't know. And I'm glad I stayed for the second half. I was like, that is awesome in the movie and the pacing changes. And the second half is definitely. But it was that was a good movie. How about about you, Gary? Well, I was going to say 1917 since that was kind of recent, but uh, I actually was also thinking um, Apocalypse Now uh, has a really oh. a, a lot of really good cinematic yeah, uh, cinema, cinematographic cinematography. <laughs> yes, thank you. Cin- it, one yeah, of them words. The what have we been talking about all day? Yes. It, it's got <laughs> a lot of really good shots of those, especially when like uh, they're like on the beaches and Robert Duvall's scene. Mm-hmm. You know, you see all the explosions in the background um, and, uh, you know, just a very wide shot that kind of captures all that. So what's that's going to be what's your favorite smell in the morning? Um, bacon. I think that's everybody's. Favorite. I was setting you up for for napalm yeah. yeah. no nope. it was it was apparently yeah. bacon that's actually the line oh, you okay. didn't know that yeah. they so, actually swapped so, it at the last I minute saw the director's cut that no one else watched yes, got yes, it yeah. i feel very yeah, privileged yeah, that's what and was. blessed to have seen that you should so uh okay all right uh, bj your turn finally what all right here here's what i'll go back i'll go back with something that is probably an arguably one of the best movies ever made period that I think very few people would call you out on. They might say, Hey, maybe this is better, but like everyone would agree with you. And then I got one that's a wild card and I don't care. I'm going to throw it in anyway. So the one that is absolutely worth watching, learning from many times is saving private Mm -hmm. Ryan. Absolutely. Uh, That movie has a really unique feature where I always see memes with it online. And every time I see one, I go back and I watch it again. Mm -hmm because this movie is so good that you're like, oh man, that was a cool scene. And then I kind of put it on to see it and I just can't, I can't stop it. It's, Steven Spielberg, it's right? It's so good. The whole, Yeah, it's so good the whole right, time. Yeah, yeah. It's got so many cool things about it that make it, uh, you know, really like that so many actors like big breaks for a lot of their stuff you know like even as much as you can someone can love or hate vin diesel that was kind of one of his big breaks was in it which is its right. whole thing like mm-hmm. there's the five minutes a lot of cool aspects yeah. 
three yeah, minutes, the five whatever. minutes before he's like, <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Um, what's your wild card? Uh, but my wild card one that I absolutely love that not enough people have seen, and I don't even know if everybody says they've seen it. You're wrong. Go watch it again. <laughs> Speed Racer by the Wachowskis. Oh, wow. That is a wild Speed card Racer. right there. I, that I've movie actually is seen it. awesome. It, I watched dude, the cartoon as a kid. I want, but I want, it, Okay, then here, let, let me set you up for what is the most ridiculous thing. They are high on power, money, and happiness after making The Matrix. They're all set up. They've got bullet time running. They're the top dogs of CG. Mm-hmm. And they were like, you know what we need to do? Speed Racer with John Goodman and Susan Sarandon. Yep, yep. that's pretty much the answer. Like, I not, need I say I more? I either one of those actors were in that. That makes me want to see it more it now. Is, <laughs> such a good movie like it is awesome my friend we i was like kind of like a weird movie night that my like we were all were kind of getting together with some friends and he's like yeah dude we should all go watch the movies oh yeah i'll pick one for the first night we're like okay and he's like we're watching speed racer and we're like ah oh, really that's our like we're not gonna watch some crazy dude it's awesome it's absolutely okay awesome. speed racer all right all right I'll, I'll okay to, i'll have to take you up on it that's that's one i've never given a chance to yeah um <laughs> all right guys well unfortunately that is all the time that we have for this week uh bj once again we want to thank you for coming on and yes, uh, hopefully you. we'll get to have you back soon uh, and uh yeah thanks yeah and uh for uh gary neil and myself and everybody at i don't give a flick i'm johnny blackburn and i'm gary elmore oh, oh i guess i'm neil Riley. Yeah, that, yeah, that's New Riley. Yeah, <laughs> I'm BJ. I, I, I guess I'm New Riley, and here's BJ. <laughs> Stay classy, everybody.